Welcome to Jat Chat presented by the Journal of Athletic Training, the official journal of the National Athletic Trainers Association. I'm Dr. Kara Radzak from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and your host for today. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Jeffrey Dover, a the senior author on the manuscript entitled Association Between Pain Catastrophizing and Pain and Cardiovascular Changes During a Cold Presser Test in Athletes from the May issue of the Journal of Athletic Training. Dr. Dover is both a certified athletic therapist and certified athletic trainer who's an associate professor at the Department of Health Kinesiology and Applied Physiology at Concordia University in Montreal. Jeff, thank you for joining me today. Thanks very much for having me. So this is probably a topic that instinctively clinicians are going to read this and say, yeah, I've probably seen somebody who's had pain catastrophizing. But not know the nitty gritty behind it. So can you give us an introduction and what is pain catastrophizing? Perfect. So it's um, it's part of the fear avoidance model, which is a group of, it's a model to explain why some people develop chronic pain and others don't. And there's a few different scales in there. Pain catastrophizing is one of them. There's also kinesophobia and fear avoidance beliefs are part of it, which are all generally measure some type of negative orientation towards pain. Okay. So pain catastrophizing is one aspect of it. There's three subscales in there, which is a helplessness and a rumination and a magnification. So that's the real negative orientation towards pain. So the, the way I describe it with clinicians is that, you know, when I, when I talk to our head athletic therapist here, uh, which is like the head athletic trainer in the States, I said, you know, do you ever have those athletes who are not good with pain? You know, mm-hmm. that uh, they're when you're doing the assessment, it doesn't really add up. Like some things hurt and some things shouldn't that, you know, that should. And, and um, they're not really compliant with the exercises. Here's another one that comes up a lot, too, is that they'll predict not being able to do something. So normally when you're in the clinic and you're rehabbing someone, you know, I've done this before where I have athletes. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get you to try to do this now. And then they sort of like fall over and I'm like, okay, that's too hard. Like, let's get something easier for you. Most athletes are like that, but some athletes they'll say, okay, we're going to get you to do this now. And then they say, oh no, I can't do that. And they don't even try. Right. Which is rare. So like, so that, that's sort of the, the group that, that I end up seeing the most is with the negative orientation towards pain. They, they feel more pain than other people with the sort of the same stimulus and they're not good with the exercises. And it really, it's a challenging situation clinically because the assessment and the rehab makes is a little bit tougher. So how do you and how did you guys in the study identify and kind of numerically give a value to this pain catastrophizing? Well, the pain catastrophizing scale. So the, the fear avoidance model was developed in the 80s to explain why Originally, it was for low back pain because low back pain, some people, it's like any other injury. It just, you know, you rehab it within two to six weeks and it's like anything else. And there's other people that have chronic low back pain that have it for a really long time. So this model was invented to, to explain why why those people took a long time to have the low back pain compared to the other ones that were done within six weeks. So they identified these psychological characteristics that really identified those people and catastrophizing was one of them. So the guy who invented the scale is Dr. Mick Sullivan, who is actually from here in Montreal as well. He's at McGill, another university here. In 1995, he published the pain catastrophizing scale. And so we use that scale in order now to measure the level of catastrophizing in people. And it's really good. So uh, this is an important point too, to say, when I say really good, you know, in research terms, that article that came out with the original um, scale has been cited over 4,000 times. So in research, that's rare to have something cited, a research article cited that much. So it really shows you how much catastrophizing has been associated with many different aspects, like in athletic training, in terms of injury and rehab and recovery and pain and stuff like that, because it's it's really associated with a lot of things. So yeah, we just use the scale. Now you mentioned the cutoff thing, which is interesting. As clinicians, we're always really interested in the cutoff, like what number's bad, right? Like, so if I got this number and you really shouldn't do that for a lot of scales, 
especially some of the psychological stuff. Okay. And so the example I always give is like range of motion. Range of motion is associated with being injured, meaning like if you have an injured knee, you'll have less range of motion than a healthy knee, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but if I asked you, what range of motion do you have to have to be officially injured? You couldn't give me a number, right? Like you can't say like 90, like normal knee flexion is 135 degrees. So you, you know, if you said 90, if it's, if it's below that, you're, you're officially injured. If it's above that, you're fine. It doesn't work like that, right? If someone came in within 89 degrees and you'd say like, oh, you're officially injured and someone came in with 91, you'd be like, oh no, you're good. You know, you're not, <laughs> yeah. right? Like it's a, you, first of all, you couldn't even see that difference. So it'd be like two degrees, right? So, and so the scale is kind of like that. It wasn't developed to like, I, to be that sensitive between measures. So you can't say 20, you're good and 19, you're messed up, right? So it's, so unfortunately, there's not a really good, there is a published cutoff for it, but I can tell you that the guy, the primary author of the scale does not like the cutoff for the use of it because it doesn't, it's for the same reason I just said. So there's an association between it. What you do know is that people who score high on the scale feel more pain than other people and people that score low on the scale is less, right? So there's not necessarily a specific number, but if you had a, the way a clinician would use it is if you're rehabbing someone and they're not getting better or like the treatment's not working or the pain's not changing or something, you can give them these scales. I'd recommend using the pain catastrophizing scale or the Tampa scale of kinesophobia. And if they score a high number, then that's something to tell you like, okay, this might be part of what's stopping them from getting better. So it's giving you insight into the bigger picture. Yeah, no, it's, it's an idea. It's an actual, it's giving you, it's a piece of the puzzle, right? So right. whenever we always teach like assessment and stuff, we look at range of motion and strength and special tests and, and you sort of put it all together to give you your diagnosis or your assessment. This is another piece, right? So someone could have, a fair bit of pain, not a lot of decreased range of motion, some positive tests, some negative tests, but then if they have a high kinesophobia or catastrophizing, then you're, it's going to be like, okay, now my big picture of rehab, it's, this might be something we need to address. So physiologically, what happens when we experience pain and how does pain catastrophizing change that in somebody? That's a great, that's a great question. So one of the things that is challenging for pain is what's the best way to measure it. We don't have an objective measure of pain, right? So that that's really limiting a lot of things that we can do because the only the best way we have to measure pain is the visual analog scale, which is or a scale out of 10, you know, 10 being the worst pain imaginable, zero being no pain at all. And when someone says I'm at an eight, I don't actually know what that is. Like, you know, it could be a two for the, for another person. Right. So therefore to measure the change physiologically, what happens is really tough because they're, you know, the, the amount of signals coming up the pyramidal tracks and through the spinal cord might be the same, but it's not, here's another good part about that explains the complexity with this. When you're inducing doing pain experiments, when we're, we never say we're inducing pain. We say we're inducing a noxious stimuli right. because it's not officially pain until it reaches the brain and someone tells you that it is, right? So in our experiment in the article, we put their the participant's hand in cold water, which is a noxious stimuli. Some people said zero. It, they felt no pain. Other people felt 10. 10 is the worst pain they've ever felt, you know, and the, but the temperature of the water was the same, right? So physiologically why is that happening we we you know you'd think that the signals coming up from the periphery to the central nervous system are the same so it's somewhere in the brain that it's getting interpreted more now that's is a whole other line of research like where in the brain that that's happening there's in the what makes that challenging is that they've done a lot of imaging studies to identify where it is in pain and a lot of places are involved so there's a tension the cognitive parts, the memory, the, you know, hypothalamus, like there's a lot of parts of the brain that light up during pain experiments. And so there's no one area to explain why someone feels more pain than others. But if we, if we ever, like I tell every year, my grad students ask me, you know, what's, what don't we have a better measure of pain or an objective measure of pain? And I'm like, man, if we could come up with that, like 
we wouldn't be sitting here. Like we'd be on my yacht somewhere with an umbrella drink and we'd never work again. Cause like, that'd be so important to do, you know? So, but, um, yeah. So what was the impetus behind the study then? Um, well, what the reason is because some people feel like that heart rate and blood pressure could be an objective measure of pain. Like it's an mm-hmm. actual physiological measure that we could see when you're in pain, you feel there is an increase in heart rate and increase specifically in the systolic blood pressure. Uh, what's been interesting is that in previous studies, they the heart rate doesn't always go up. Like some studies show that it went up and some said it went down. And so, and I really felt like it was the pain catastrophizing that we hypothesized that it was the pain catastrophizing that would explain that variability. Uh, and so that was one of our key findings from the study was that people with high catastrophizing, that would explain their change in heart rate with the same stimulus. Um, in terms of the impetus, like that, you know, that's sort of the, the micro look at it. The macro look at it is that I've always been that's what got me into this line of research is to identify why some people feel more pain than others. Right. And that was my, one of my first experiences ever as an athletic trainer was working a basketball camp in the summer. And we had a kid fall in an outstretched hand and he had a Coley's fracture, like right out of the textbook, you know, like, a, and he was just sitting there and I was like, are you okay? And he said, yeah. And I said, does it hurt? And he's like, Yeah. And I'm like, but you're okay. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, we're going to, we need to get you to a hospital now. Like, that. And he's like, okay. And I said, I'm going to wrap it up. I said, normally we'd call an ambulance, but I'm like, you seem like you're okay. And he's like, yep. And so I'm like, we're just going to get someone to drive you, you know, so we don't have to. And then a week later, it was the exact same thing. It was the same age kid, male, you know, same, fell on an outstretched hand. It looked exactly the same and was screaming and rolling around and a lot of pain. And we, it was going in and out of shock. He was very pale. And so, but what was crazy about it is that this was a small rural town in Ontario, Canada. And we actually got the x-rays back from the hospital from both kids. And when you put them up, it was identical, like, like the same amount broken. Right. And that's what really started to like, well, how is that possible? Because we were always taught, you know, first degree sprain or a little bit of damage to be a little bit of pain and then more of a tear there'd be more pain like it's a direct correlation with that but clinically again what most people will recognize after they've worked for a bit is that uh, or even after internships is that not everyone you know the amount of pain people experience is quite varied right so that was really where it started was to try to explain why some people feel more pain than others so give us some more explanation, the difference between pain tolerance and pain catastrophizing. Perfect. Yeah. So there's a lot of terms that are used like pain tolerance or point tenderness or uh, pain threshold. Uh, and depending who you talk to or what reference you're using, they mean significantly different things. Okay. So the key part is always looking at the dependent variable. So when someone says pain tolerance, that will be like in a, an amount of how much they can take until they say, stop doing it. Like it's, it's too painful. Mm -hmm. There's another Mm -hmm. measure, which is the threshold, which is you apply point tenderness until they say it goes from pressure to pain. So once it's, once it becomes painful, then you stop. And so that, so that's another measure. Um, and so the, yeah. So, so when people often ask, you know, like the, what's a common question, but men and women, who's better, who has a more pain tolerance, right? right. Is a common question. And so that's what made that difficult is that a lot of studies measure it differently. Like they'll use the pain pressure threshold or the tolerance, or sometimes they just say with the same, stimulus like how painful is it uh, which is another measure um and so it's really hard to compare across studies uh just to answer that question i don't actually i thought for the longest time there's actually no difference between men and women with pain tolerance for example i thought it was mostly the psychological stuff that would explain that meaning the catastrophizing or kinesophobia mm-hmm. so that in studies if you randomly had like 20 guys and 20 girls if you happen to have more people in the girl group that had high catastrophizing than the men group, then that would explain the difference in the pain. 
Um, but there's enough studies to show now when they look at, especially with chronic conditions and low back pain, that the prevalence is more in women than men. Um, and so that's, you could make the argument that you could say that women experience more pain than men, like in general, um, you know, but, and this was something actually that just came up earlier today. We were in, uh, um, a diversity workshop and they, one of the things they talked about was more research on African American or trans and people identify differently with the male female, um, because there's just not a lot of research on that, but stuff is coming out now. So, which is really interesting. So that's going to change a lot in terms of our measurements and what we're going to be looking for in the future. That's interesting. So tell us more about what you did in this study. What, um, what was your methodological setup? So this study, we wanted to look at, you know, people always think that athletes are good with pain or they, they experience pain less than non-athletes. Right. And so we wanted to look at, you know, how athletes reacted to a noxious stimuli, which is the cold presser test and to see what their pain numbers were like compared to non-athletes, but also if this psychological factors like the pain-related fear would explain some of the experience, like the, their pain feeling or pain experience, and if it was associated with the cardiovascular variables. That was the important part to us because, again, that is an, an indication of a physiological measure that might explain you know, a more objective measure of what someone's experiencing. So that was the idea. We wanted to get, we got a rugby team because we thought those are athletes are uh, regarded by some as the more would have the best pain tolerance, you know, out of any group that you could pick, Uh, you know, and I'm not officially saying that I'm just saying that some people feel that way. And, um, you know, and then we wanted to do the cold presser test because we've done it in non-athletes before. And so we wanted to do it in a group of athletes. So and then and then see what it was like, um, you know, with that. So. And what did you guys end up finding? So our key, the some of the key findings was that the catastrophizing explained the amount of pain experienced during the cold presser test. That's been shown before, Mm -hmm. but it was nice to see that it happened in athletes, too. Right. So that means that. Everyone put their hand in the same temperature water. Exactly. It was cold water. And the people who had high catastrophizing reported more pain compared to the people that had low catastrophizing. Uh, The part that was interesting, one of our key findings was that the change in heart rate. So when people experienced an increase in heart rate from putting their hand in the cold water, that change was also explained by catastrophizing. And that's something that hasn't been shown before. Um, and so that was something that we were, you know, for that to be true in athletes uh, was a was a key finding. Because we've always, on the rehab side of things, we've looked at catastrophizing, kinesophobia, and fear avoidance related to injury and rehab. But this was sort of the first experimental uh, pain induction study that also showed it, which was nice to show it in the in that model as well. So can pain catastrophizing be decreased? Yep, that's a great question. So in the right now in the States, especially with PTs and low back pain in the US, the catastrophizing and kinesophobia are part of their standard guidelines for treatment with chronic low back pain. So that means like and you know, that means that if you're in the US and you go to a PT clinic you know, with chronic low back pain, and they don't measure your catastrophizing or kinesophobia, that's sort of considered negligent, right? Because it's part of their standard guidelines. And that's something that we, that's what's so important in athletic training and the NATA is to keep up with evidence-based practice and to make changes and competencies based on involving research. Because some studies have shown that people with high kinesophobia, for example, will take longer to rehab with an ACL than ones that don't. And that's something that's right in our wheelhouse in terms of our scope of practice. So that'll be something we need to address. So now, like you said, to get back to your question, can you change it? So yes, the catastrophizing or kinesophobia, if they're high, there are ways of reducing it. Now, the first evidence was cognitive behavioral therapy. Some of those interventions were effective at reducing catastrophizing or kinesophobia, which are protected acts by psychologists. But there was a group out of Duke University with Dr. Stephen George who developed what he called psychologically informed practice. 
So that's your regular practice as a PT, in addition to some cognitive behavioral based treatment ideas. And you sort of mash them together when you're, when you're applying your treatment to the patient. And then that'd be a way of reducing their catastrophizing while also improving their function and range of motion and strength. And so I always felt like if, you know, if PTs can do it, so can we. And so we'd like to adopt that type of practice to athletic training or an athletic therapy so that when we have an athlete with a high kinesophobia or catastrophizing, we could make our own psychologically informed practice as part of our regular. And again, I want to stress that we're not not doing the regular things like the stretching, the rehab and the exercise, the therapeutic exercise modalities, very important. But you just add these cognitive behavioral um, treatments or uh, points that you can address during the treatment. And then that way we can reduce it so that would improve their function. So what do you recommend clinicians that are listening to this as their first step to start adding this into their clinical practice? So the first thing is just to be aware of it. So to know that, and and most clinicians will already be at this point where they'll recognize people who are not good with pain, right? And they're not, they, they, the assessment isn't adding up and they're not great with the exercises. So when you have someone like that, the first thing you can do is get them to fill out the pain catastrophizing scale or kinesophobia, TSK, the Tampa scale kinesophobia, or the athlete fear avoidance questionnaire. And if they have a high number, then you know, then that's something that you'll need to address as part of your rehab. So right now, clinicians, athletic trainers, ATs are really good at coming up with a targeted rehab program, right? We want to decrease pain in the knee. We want to increase strength in the quad. We want to increase our plyometric, you know, strength. And so unless you put for those patients that have the high catastrophic kinesophobia, unless you put the decreased kinesophobia on your rehab plan, like they're not going to get better. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and this is, and again, I want to stress that this isn't for everybody. Like this isn't saying you should do this with every single person, but you should, when you, for sure, there's that group, the handful of people that aren't getting better at the same rate that other ones are. And we need to, we could have, use this to help address, to the, to help them get better. Perfect. Is there anything else that you want to add to leave with our listeners? Hmm. What are you looking forward to about and kind of things that make you excited in this area of research that are up and coming? Wow. It's, um, I'm really excited. Well, the thing that I like most about athletic training and athletic therapy is the constant change of the profession and, and what's been, you know, in my time, when I started out rehabbing an ACL was 12 months, you know, and then it became six months and we had using an ultrasound on a fracture was a contraindication. And now it's part of a, you can get low intensity ultrasound as part of the treatment for a fracture. And so anyway, those are the things that I, I like the most about my job. And uh, that there's, I'm always learning and, you know, learning how to do things better. And I think pain is something that, why I originally got into it is something that every, you know, that's when we, those are the people we see. Like when an athlete has pain somewhere and we're trying to make it better, we're trying to get them back to competition and what's the best way to do that. Those are the things that I, I like the most. Thank you so much, Dr. Dover. Really appreciate you taking your time to talk with me today. And just a reminder that this manuscript and all of JAT's offerings are are online, um, free of ac- free access for everyone. Again, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me.